please have your 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 Bibles open uh, in that passage that we read earlier uh, in one Colossians. That is the passage we're going to be looking at over the next uh, twenty five or so uh, minutes together. Now, in we read verses fifteen to twenty. In verses 15 to 17, uh, which we would have looked at a few months ago, uh, I missed last month because I wasn't well, uh, but we looked at that section 15 to 17 a few months ago. And what we saw in that section is that if you and I want to know God, if you and I want to see God, if you and I want to understand who God is, we must look at Jesus Christ. Verse 15, he is the invisible, he is the image of the invisible God and the exact imprint of his nature we read elsewhere. We saw, didn't we, that uh, all things were created by him, through him, and for him. You and I sitting in our seats this morning, those who are listening uh, perhaps online, Michael Monet and John who went through the waters this morning. Anyone who is at Tesco's now or at Pizza Hut across the road at this moment, everyone who is here this morning, everything has been made by him, through him, and for him. In, in short, and let me summarize, there is nothing that has been made that doesn't have a made by Jesus tag on it. Creation, even in its fallen state, is sustained by him. And even if faintly so, it continues to sing his song, as the hymn writer says. And so, in furthering our understanding of this Jesus Christ, we concluded rightly, and we have heard testified this morning, that there is nothing that we can do or bring to him. There is nothing that we can present, add, or increase to him that would give him value or worth. He is wholly sufficient in himself. There is nothing that we could contribute, nothing that we could put in place that would help him out in any sort of way. He is the creator of all things. There is nothing that is above him. And so in realizing that we can't bring anything worthwhile to the table, the, in that understanding, we saw the grace and the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That these people that this letter was written to needed to understand. That you and I this morning need to hear, understand, and perhaps be reminded of. You see, the letter to the Colossians was written to a group of people who were being tempted and encouraged to forget that Jesus Christ is sufficient. The reality is that we come to God as we are. We don't bring to him gifts or rules and regulations. We don't get to him through a medium or any other sort of spiritualism. It is not because of anything we have done. It is nothing that you and I bring to the party. No, 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 none of that matters. We are able to come to God only because of faith in Jesus Christ. Because, because of who he is and because of what he has done. He is enough. There is nothing that should be, can be added to him. And so this morning we are still looking through this section of verses 15 to 20. Where Paul is describing and sketching a picture of who Jesus Christ was, and not just who he was then, but who he still is today. Without Jesus Christ, there is no life, there is no Christianity. And so what we are discussing this morning, what we are reading matters. It is important for us to, to think it through, because with him, we get to understand life as it ought to be. We get to understand the Christian faith in reality. And for all of that, we need to look at Jesus. For our part this morning, we're not going to go through the whole section. Uh, some of you will breathe out and be relieved to hear that. We're only going to be looking at one verse, and actually only a part of one verse. 
And that's verse 18. And part of verse 18. And I'll read it again for you. And if you have your Bibles open, that would help me. And it would help you because you will see that I'm not making any of this up. And where I am making it up, you can challenge me up here. I would welcome that. Verse 18, the bit we will be looking at reads, and he is the head of the body, the church. That is all we are looking at this morning. So Paul, having written about Christ's role and his supremacy over all creation, in verse 18, we start to see Paul talking about how Christ interacts with the new creation, beginning with the church. Now, in, in the Bible, across the Bible, and um, yeah, across the Bible, in the New Testament in particular, there are many pictures given to describe the church. It's seen as a bride. Uh, it, the church is described as uh, a, a temple, uh, as a, a flock even. But the main picture that is given in the New Testament, as far as I can see, and as I've heard, is that the church is often described as a body. Now, it being described as a body is significant because it communicates to us that the church is a living organism. And as I've heard a preacher say, it is not a dead organization. We are not a club here or a, a, a company or a charity or an NGO. We are a living thing to be contended with in this world. When the body is talked about in the Bible and even in science for the students amongst us, generally the picture that's being painted is of the way the various parts work together. So there is a mutual dependence of the different members of the body on one another. Each member, each part having its specific role to perform. So different parts of the body do different things which are necessary and helpful for the whole. So you, you, we see this in, in Romans uh, 12, 45. You don't have to turn there. I'll read, I'll read it very quickly. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, that is the church, though we are many, are one body in Christ and individually members to one another. So to color this in, if I'm seeing Alan at the corner there, and I want to go to him and give him a hug, what's happening there is my eyes are seeing him, my feet need to get me there, and my arms need to open up to give him a hug. Whether or not he takes it is up to him. But each part has its part to play. Each member of the body has its part to play. And that is how the church is described. And we see that being referenced in this verse we're looking at, 18, verse 18 in Colossians. Now, how the, the, the body is described in, in general is very different to the stress that is being given in Colossians, in this verse and in the book as a whole. In Colossians, the focus isn't so much on how we interact together as individuals, as different parts. Well, what is being stressed? What is being uh, pushed and is being made urgent and is being communicated is that for the body to function, there is a total dependence needed by the whole body on the head. For there to be life, for the body to live and to work, there must be a head. If a body doesn't have a head, it will die. If it attempts to change its head, it will die. As far as I know, head transplants are not yet a thing. If a body loses its connection with its head, it will die. A body without a head is dead. And I've heard someone say a body with more than one head is a monster. The church, the the true church, the, the Christian church has one head, and that is Jesus Christ. If Christ is not the head, it is no longer a church. With this in mind, having said that and understood that, let me make it clear. 
without wanting to unnecessarily cause offense. There is no disciple, there is no apostle, there is no student, no priest, no prophet that is the head of the church. There is no saint, there is no bishop, no cardinal and no pope, no organization, no preacher, no pastor that is the head of the church. There is no earthly prince, there is no king, no princess and no queen that is at the head of the church. There is no president, no minister, no prime minister, no elder, no deacon, no board, no government, no man, no woman, no angel that is at the head of the church. The true church has and recognizes only one head forever and always, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. That is a profound truth that you and I need to get our hearts around and understand this morning. Now today, Monet, John and Michael, we have heard their testimonies and have seen them getting baptized. That act of baptism is a confirmation of the headship of Christ. As has been said already, these three are not part of the church because they've been baptized. In, in acknowledging and recognizing Jesus Christ as the sacrifice for their sins and putting their trust in him for forgiveness, they are already a part of the church. In getting baptized, though, in acknowledging their faith, what they have done is they have demonstrated obedience to the commands of the head of the church. And so in getting baptized, they have acknowledged they have a head. We have seen a wonderful thing today, a picture of sins, are, of how sins are forgiven and how new life is given to the body by the head. Now there's two there's two ways in which Jesus is the head that I want us to consider very quickly. I will not go for long today, I promise. And we, we are already starting to circle a little bit. The head is the source and the origin of life. That's my first one. The head is the source and the origin of life. So we've already touched on this a little bit. With no head, the body is dead. Uh, and... Uh, but I want us to look at this from a little bit of a, a different angle. Where I'm saying that Jesus Christ as the head is the source and the origin of the church's life. He is the source and the origin of the new life that Monet, John, and my brother Michael have testified to. Some 2,000 years ago. The God-man, Jesus Christ, was crucified on a Roman cross. He died for our sins. The punishment that is due, was due to mankind from a holy God because we don't match up to his standard. That is what he took when he died. If we look at the things you and I, if you and I are honest and God gives us that grace, and we look at the things we have done this week, participated in, said, not said. If God gives us that grace to overcome the deceit in our hearts, we will know that we cannot stand before a righteous and holy God. And so there is a punishment to you. In dying, Jesus Christ took upon himself the punishment so that he could spare us saving us from it. Forgiveness and access to God is given only on the basis of faith in Christ alone. After his death, he came back to life. He resurrected and is alive now. There and here is where the church is. Following the resurrection, men, women, boys and girls saw him and believed and became the church. 
they told the story, they wrote letters and news spread and continues to spread today about who he is and what he has done. And the church has grown. It is because of his death and particularly because of his resurrection that the church exists. Without him, without Jesus Christ, there would be no church. There couldn't be. Anyone who believes in him gets added to the church. And so in this way, he is the source and the origin of the church. In this way, he is the head of the church. The life that the church has is his risen life, which he spares and gives to his people. In John 15, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking and teaching and says that he is the true vine. I am the true vine. And, and I'll paraphrase a little bit to, 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 to make it brief, but he goes on to say that only the branches that are in him, only the branches that are attached to the new vine will live and bear fruit. He is the source and origin of life. A branch that is detached from him, that is not connected to him, has no life and withers. It bears no fruit and has no use, except to be thrown out. And that is not a place any of us want to be. He is the source and the origin of life. That is what it means for him to be head. Point number two, the head as the leader. When the Colossians would have read this letter, they would have understood, and maybe some of us already here have picked it up, that there's, of course, this organic, biological connection between the head and the body. They would also, though, have understood the head of the body also could, also means, not could, does mean the Lord of the body, the leader of the body. The head is was then and is still very much now considered the governing part of our bodies. You and I at the moment, each, of, each one of us is sitting, breathing and not thinking about it. You're not having to think to breathe. Our heads are running that. And so that still remains the case. The head is seen as the governing part of the body. Your systems inside you are being run by the computing in your head. And so the head ultimately controls the body in addition to providing for its life. And so if we, let's think of the language we use even now, you would hear things like the head of state, the head of security, the, the head of the table, the head of the family, the, the head of the house. In all these statements, the word head is communicating authority and leadership. The, a, a governing rule of some kind. And so the same understanding would have existed in the minds of the readers of this letter. And so, yes, we should see Christ as the source of life for the church. But we must, if we are to be a true church, acknowledge him as also its supreme leader. This means that the directions for how the church is, how it runs, come from Jesus Christ and not from any other source or authority. When the church takes its mind and its heart away from Christ or associates with other things as its reason for being, when Christ is not listened to as, as head and he's not respected as the authority and governor, what you will find is that human ideas and thoughts Tradition and rituals start to take hold. This is what was happening to these believers in philosophy. There were other things that were starting to invade and take priority of how they saw and worshipped God. They were no longer getting their direction from their head. We must be vigilant and mindful not to fall into the same error. As head, we must also be careful to not see Jesus Christ as a tyrant or a dictator 
He is not an oppressive leader. He is not a bully or a menace. For this reference, I would like you to join me. Please meet me in your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 5. In the blue Bibles, which I have in front of me, that is page 978. So we're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to be reading verses 23 to 27, and again verse 29. Now, in this section, just to give you a, a bit of background, the writer Paul is writing to the Ephesians and is talking about what headship should look like in marriage, what headship should look like in a Christian marriage. And he uses the example of Jesus Christ's headship of the church as the reference point. And so we're not focusing on, on the marriage point this morning. We're looking, we're wanting to pick up the reference to how Christ interacts with his church. And, and it says this in, in those verses. So that's 23 we're starting at. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself, in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Verse 29 goes on to say, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Now, in these verses, we see that Jesus Christ, as the head, as the leader, as the governor, as the chief shepherd of the church, loves the church. He loves the church so much that verse 25, he gave his life for her. For the church's life, for the church's building up, for the church's good. This again is a picture of our gospel, our Jesus Christ dying to save undeserving sinners and those saved sinners becoming the church that he so loved. Verse 29, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church. As the head, he nourishes and cherishes his church. He cares for the church. He is our leader. He is for our good, which is ultimately for his great pleasure and his glory. In Colossians 2 verse, 9, 2 verse 19, where we will get to in a, maybe in a year's time or so, um, it tells us that it is from the head where we get nourishment and growth. So as we now start coming into land, the question which some of you may have will be, okay then, Lloyd, I've heard you and I've understood that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. So what? what? What is it to me? Why does it matter? And and before I answer that question, I want to acknowledge and appreciate, as is always the case, that we will have different groups of people on Sunday mornings. And so what I'm going to try to do is to talk to each group as best as I can. To, to those of you who are here, who are present with us today or, or online, or who will listen to this later, who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior, then you cannot testify like Monet, John, and Michael did this morning that you know the forgiveness of sins. That is not your story. You are not in the body. And so what I've said about him being the head doesn't apply. He is not your head. We, as a local church here in Felton, long that he would be. This is something that we long for. You. Not because we, we want to build an empire, but because we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And we want you to taste and see that the Lord is good. This Jesus who we speak about and gather here to remember 
week after week is, is real and he is lofty. He is beautiful and majestic. He is simple yet regal. He is significant. And in the last 20 minutes, we have barely begun to scratch the surface of who he really is. And so to you, I say, come to him and he will remove the burdens you carry and he will give you rest. He will make you right with God. Salvation has no other name but Jesus Christ. We pray that your eyes would be opened and that you would see him as he really is. And that you too would acknowledge him as head. To those of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ, but have forgotten that he is your head. And I would put myself in this category. You and I have started perhaps to look at other things for direction. We have started to turn to other sources for our security and our assurance of salvation. Our eyes and our efforts are looking somewhere else for our nourishment. We have allowed ourselves to be distracted and are neglecting the source and origin of our life. The longer you and I continue on this path, the closer to death we look and the more like it we become. We need to remember who we are in him. We are a part of his body. And above all, we need to see him and meditate on who he is, supreme over all and what he has done and consider what it cost him to bring you and I into the faith. The challenge for us is that we should rightly refocus our attention and our affections on him. Practically, that means trying to put into place things during your week, habits and disciplines that will give us the opportunities that we need to look upon him. We need to prioritize this. The world we are in is not going to help us. It will throw distractions at us. We need to bat them away. Those of you who are here who know Jesus Christ as head, and so for you, you are living uh, rightly in that reality. You have the disciplines and the habits in place that enable you to remember him as, as the head of your life, as the source of your life. If that is you, my encouragement then for you is to keep on. Help those of us who are forgetting. Help those of us who are wondering. Tap us back into the head. Get us back in the game. Check in on people who you know are struggling. See how they are doing practically. And let's keep each other accountable. And let's keep going. Finally, to close, as a local church here in Felton, we are, of course, a local church. So we're a small part of the whole church. We need to remember that Felton Evangelical Church is Jesus Christ's church. This isn't Pastor Philip Venable's church. This isn't the deacon's church or the elder's church. This is a church that belongs to Jesus Christ. He is its head. No man, woman, or child, boy, or girl has that role or responsibility in this church. Him alone we honor. It is him alone we worship. And it is him alone that we seek to serve here. May God help us to remember this. Our closing hymn is one which I think we will probably sing every time we're in this passage. Uh, I saw a, a new vision of Jesus. And the reason why that will become a recurring hymn is because as we go through Colossians, as we look to Jesus Christ, what I am praying for, longing for, for myself, and by extension to you, is that you would see Jesus Christ in you. That you and I would see him right. And so please stand with the music when it starts to sing our closing hymn. Uh, and 